Hello and welcome to Talk Thursday. This morning we have a great opportunity to speak to one of the leading business minds in the Philippines. Uh, we're speaking with Jaime Augusto Zobel de Ayala. He is chairman of the Ayala Group of Companies. He's recently come back from APEC and I'd love to start with that. Hello, Jaime. Yeah. Welcome to Talk Thursday. Um, morning. How would you describe the Philippines today? Well, the Philippines is uh, actually at a very uh, exciting stage, I guess, in its trajectory. We just came back from APEC. It was quite exciting because uh, the Russians decided to hold it in Vladivostok, which is unusual. Um, and I think that's their way of signaling that they wanted that part of Russia that is linked to the Pacific as their, as their link uh, to APEC. Um, what was interesting was that uh, Vladivostok was a, a hidden corner of Russia and yet they poured an enormous amount of infrastructure into Vladivostok to welcome, I guess, the APEC group. And so in a glimpse you can see what, how you can take a hidden corner of the world, uh, an old port town, naval base of Russia, and really turn it potentially into a center of gravity uh, through the use of infrastructure. So in that sense, that was an interesting learning. But um, from the Philippine point of view, it was very nice to be welcomed uh, as part of APEC at a time when the country is really feeling strong, is doing well, and is really, you know, a, a cut above the rest from a growth agenda point of view and from an economic agenda point of view. And what is the view from the outside in terms of well, where we are Well, uh, the point of view of the outside is, is always subjective, but generally, if I were to summarize it, it would be a very positive one. Um, you know, we are one of the three largest growth countries in the world right now. Uh, China still remains strong, even though it's slowed down. And then Indonesia is just a slightly ahead of us. But in the first half of this year, growing at 6% puts us actually at the very top of, of, of the categories in the world. So uh, there is a focus on the Philippines. There's generally a focus on emerging markets really being an exciting new area for the world. And we are very much on top of that list. So um, there is a lot of attention on us, and I think people are looking. Uh, we've had some difficult years in the past, so credibility yes. is hard to build. Correct. But I think we have come a long way in garnering, I guess, people's attention and getting people to start focusing on us. Is this growth sustainable? Yeah. I think so. I tend to look at the glass always as half full you rather are. than half empty. So uh, I'm the wrong person to talk to as I'm the perennial optimist, even in the most difficult of times. But, uh, but yes, I would say very much so. The steps being taken by the Philippine government right now uh, do lead to sustainability. And what do I mean by that? First and foremost, um, uh, the Philippine government has put a great deal of emphasis on the whole issue of governance. And I think uh, the president's ratings are very visible in, in the news these days. It's very, very high. And I think a lot of that is the kind of credibility he has brought to uh, the standards that the country is currently following. So issues of governance, of seriousness um, in the way we do things, the rule of law, um, and really bringing our economic house in order, doing the right things, has put us on the map in a new way. And that kind of credibility is not easy to build. So I think that's a major uh, building block for sustainability. The second one, and again, I tend to deal in the world of, of economics, um, all the elements necessary to create sustainable economic growth are being put into place. Uh, what do I mean by that? You've got a very strong you know, discipline beginning to take place on, on, on the fiscal side. Yes. Um, just like you run your household or, or, or your company, uh, the government is, is basically earning more than it's spending. Yes. Um, our, our current account surplus is positive. We have more foreign exchange reserves than ever in our history. That's given, I guess, our central bank a strong hand in how to manage our currency. And that gives them tools for the future. Uh, it's kept our interest rates low. Mm -hmm. Companies are able to borrow. Uh, and the governance side has also given us long-term credibility for the longer type of investments that are necessary, not just the shorter ones. So there are many elements being put into place on the economic front that create a virtuous cycle. And, um, and on many fronts, that is, that is taking place. But there are still many problems there. I mean, we came from Absolutely, the Integrity yeah. uh, Summit mm -hmm. uh, a few days ago. And corruption, while it's improved significantly, right. is also still really bad. You have yeah. nearly 50% receiving a bribe and only 1 in 10 reported. So yeah. you're still... What are the challenges of doing well, business here? Well, th th that's certainly an issue, and it has been an issue for many years. What's always important is the kind of momentum you build towards addressing them. And I go back to that issue of governance. If you're serious about governance, eventually, and a country progressively moves up the economic curve, corruption generally declines. Maybe another way to look at it, Maria, is that if you look at any country and you look at an equation or a curve, um, as a country moves up the economic curve, let's say per, as measured, say, by per capita GNP or yes. the like, 
corruption generally goes down because there's more transparency, more higher governance principles, people move to world-class standards. Mm -hmm. So that's the other side of the equation. As you move up the line and these governance issues begin to take place, as you move up the economic ladder, by its very nature, corruption also tends to decline. You will never see a country high on that curve with a very high corruption index. So I think all of those things come hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, I also like to think this is a very subjective point of view that as, as we have a very large grouping of, of, of our countrymen working abroad, they're picking up a whole set of different standards mm -hmm. that I like to think are bringing more of an international sense of where we stand and a sense of, of, of world-class standards to the way they behave, they look at things, and they bring that back as well to the mm -hmm. country in their own way. Um, so all of these things, our engagement with the world, our engagement with the service sector is also a feedback mechanism to the kind of standards people are looking for in the country. And, and that give and take, I think, creates the right kind of tension for our country uh, to progress. Well, you're talking about our people in terms of where they are globally. Yes. How competitive is the Philippines right now? Yeah. Well, we have still uh, many challenges. I think in certain fields, we're very strong and competitive. The service sector, of course, comes to mind. Uh, we yes. would not be a major player in the global service sector and in the business processing out sector in the Philippines if, um, if we were not a country that, that was competitive in that sense. So that's a great area to work with and uh, an area that is very strong. Where we're weaker are the basic um, infrastructure elements that are necessary uh, to promote manufacturing and, 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 and other areas in the Philippines. But, you know, we have to start from somewhere. We've got a great base on the service sector side. How to translate that to other sectors like agriculture and manufacturing, of course, is a challenge that many countries face, not just ourselves. You've also done work to try to boost technology. I mean, uh, uh, PhilDev and uh, yeah. try to bring in education, yeah. education levels. How, how do we stand in terms of well, you know, from we have a long way. The, the challenges of education are large ones. We have a, a country that continues to grow, uh, probably at a higher rate than most of the challenges to a government budget and funding the educational needs, which are, of course, far more demanding now in, 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 in an economic environment that clearly demands uh, more individuality, more imagination, and, and more technology-savvy individuals. Um, the challenges are great. Um, so there is a long way to go on the educational front and uh, the challenges will always be there but groups like PhilDev uh, which really started as an Ayala Foundation project and now has been taken over by a, a great chairman Dado Banatao is really putting a lot of focus on the science and technology part which in general terms has been a weaker component of our educational system. I think we're generally stronger in the humanities and many other elements that have also made us strong but um, you know the world cannot live these days without a strong science and technology uh, branch. So to put a little bit of emphasis on that and to have a very strong foundation, uh, particularly led with someone uh, with the kind of experience that uh, Dado Banata has built up in credibility in the science and technology field, is just a wonderful boost, I think, to the whole technology field. And he's, he's uh, really coming up with some very exciting programs. He's linking us up to, to the United States, uh, to, to universities like uh, Berkeley in California, and really bringing some, some great knowledge to, to tie up to the Philippines with universities like like the University of the Philippines and the like. And, and, and that kind of combustion and bringing back our scientists and getting them to speak is, is, I think, a very positive one for young people. Well, technology itself now, it is shifting the ground underneath yeah. many businesses and shifting business models all around. I mean, mm -hmm. in, in the businesses that you handle, how is technology changing the way you're doing well, business? Well, technology, if used uh, constructively, can be a great disintermediator. Right. In, in industries and, and the key is to find yourself at those crossroads and use it productively to change things. As you know, we're, uh, we're one of the groups that have invested fairly heavily on, on, on restructuring the whole telecommunications infrastructure of the country. We came in in the 1990s. If you recall, about eight or nine companies entered the field at the time and, and really there are only two uh, that are fundamentally left ourselves and, and uh, the old incumbent. Uh, but that having been said, as an industry, even though we're only really 
two players at this point in time and maybe three, um, there is a lot of investment going into building the infrastructure needed to allow, uh, I guess, the whole new social media and, 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 and the new ways of using technology to thrive in our country. And I think that's a very positive thing. Um, uh, although there is competition between the two companies, I think what's important to focus on is the fact that there's a great deal of money being spent in building the infrastructure necessary uh, for this new technology platform to evolve and for the individual users to be able to access it and use it productively as technology is allowing now. And I think that's a very exciting thing for our country, particularly a country that is very adept at the social media field, very comfortable with it. Uh, you yourselves are an example of that phenomenon, uh, Maria. And so for us to be able to create the kind of infrastructure necessary for people to be able to live off that, take advantage of it, and make this a thriving um, technology hub is, I guess, the job that we have uh, within the Ayala Group. Well, how do you compare, um, right now, uh, we've got irate customers from both sides yes. complaining about uh, infrastructure. Um, is this a period of growth uh, when demand exceeds capacity? I mean, we saw yeah, this happen I, in the I United think, States. I think, you know, I, uh, the best way to look at it is, is, is is um, telecommunications become a very personalized thing. So people feel it very strongly. In other words, you don't go through any day now without referring to your phone, using your computer, accessing you information. So, yeah. so people are very sensitive to it and, and we have to be sensitive to that. Right. Uh, so I understand where sometimes the frustration comes from. I think what people have to understand though is that given the plethora of new ways of communicating, the fact that those costs are coming down has really made the data surge tremendously high. In other words, there's massive demand flowing through the system now, not only within the Philippines, but the Philippines to the outside world, and the outside world, by the way, coming, coming back. back. I mean, Correct. it's always shocked me how large a component we are of the traffic, let's say, between the United States and the Philippines. We're, we're way up there in the top five of, of, of traffic generators as a country in and out of the U.S., not just one way. So the telecommunication companies have to adjust to this new reality. And I think it is more that. And, and the positive thing is a tremendous amount is being done by the industry to address it. Now, this is not just a Philippine phenomenon. You've got to understand this is happening globally. If you go to New York, I can assure you that the communications, while they're good, are not also perfect. So everyone's dealing with this surge in data. Um, uh, people are being able to access it and, and use it much more so because of the price points that have come down. It is our job, I guess, as infrastructure builders to adjust to it. And I think we are as mm -hmm. an industry. There's a lot of money being put into it, probably more than any other industry in the Philippines. And I think people don't appreciate that. Um, it's not yet perfect, but a great deal is going in. And I think the industry will come up to bat and be able to give people what they need. And I think that'll be felt far sooner rather than later. There's a great deal of capital expenditure going into it, and I think we will have absolutely world-class systems here. It's just there's a transition period taking place. Um, but the important thing, I think, for people to understand is that transition is taking place and taking place fast. So if people can just hold their breath for a little while, um, I think it'll happen sooner than later. Towards the end of this year, beginning of next year, you already feel dramatic differences in the kind of infrastructure we have. On this that year, the big into next year? Uh, into, about. yeah, and maybe towards the end of 2012, the beginning of 2013, there'll be, uh, the infrastructure will be breathing a lot more easily because we're really preparing for five to six years from now. Um, internet penetration rate is roughly only at around 33% yeah. now in the Philippines, so you're talking about a third of the population who can right. access it on, right. online. M how, how do you see bridging this digital divide? Well, it's really moving very much into the mobile space. Yes. Uh, once upon a time, we saw reaching the internet just, what, four or five years ago as having a computer, a laptop sitting in front of a desk and having, you know, a connection through a th slow line. These days, people are accessing the internet, the social media space through their personal uh, gadgets. And uh, these smartphones, these pa iPads, uh, these, these uh, tools are beginning to access at a much uh, lower price point. People are beginning to be able to use it and use the internet far more productively now than they ever were in the past. So I think internet penetration rates are going to be shooting up very rapidly. The way mobile moved up, the way texting moved up, and people will have the wherewithal to do it. Uh, we have seen a massive uh, uh, buy-in into the smartphone phenomena. Yes. And smartphones really are far more complex devices. They are really doing what 
you know, computers were able to do five, six, seven years ago, people are being able to access the internet much more uh, from a much more immediate point of view. And it's just not through broadband, it's also through, you know, the uh, telecom network, the 3G network moving on to the 4G network. And so you're going to see interest, I internet penetration rates actually move up to a whole different level very, very fast. And I guess our job is to create the kind of infrastructure that will allow people to do that at a low price point and in a cost effective way. That's we a big want challenge. that. We definitely <laughs> want that in Rappler. Yeah. <laughs> we'll yeah. survive on this. Yeah. Um, but I in the United States, uh, they hit the tipping point in terms of people accessing the yes. internet through mobile in 2010. When do you think the Philippines will get there? Well, that's harder to predict. I, I don't have a number off the top of my head. I look more at the trending side. I think yeah. what you're going to see is you know double digit uh, growth rates beginning to take place from now on. The base will get larger. Very hard to extrapolate that, but things tend to f happen faster uh, than expected in this yes. world. It has happened to me since the 1990s when we first entered the telecommunication industry. Things happen far faster than ever predicted. So I think it's going to happen fast. You'll see, I think in a decade, a tremendous change in the way the Philippine interacts with the internet with very high penetration rates, given the fact that most people have a telephone at this stage. So it's more a matter of their ability to afford, I guess, a smartphone and, 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 and those costs continue to come down on a regular basis. So I have no doubt that the increases will be tremendous. I'm personally hoping that happens this yeah. year and to <laughs> mid next year. This is for, yeah. um, but, but Jaime, in terms of what it can do. So once everyone is, more people are accessing the internet mm. through their own mobile devices, yes. their personal devices. Um, how does this change the world the way we see yeah. it now? I think it's all about the way people harness information. It's not just about the social media space. We're very yeah. big as a country on that space, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, communication, the sharing of information, but I think once that translates to, I guess, a knowledge-based economy, the sharing of information for productive purposes that lead to a strengthening of, of an economy, then you're getting a much more robust uh, economy that's very geared, I guess, to the future. What do I mean by that? Uh, you take our agricultural sector, it's a big sector. Imagine a world where the average farmer uh, can begin to access mobile payments, get information on their crops, disintermediate middlemen who are making large, uh, I guess, uh, intermediary fees from them. Yeah, uh, uh, I mean, you're really bringing the whole supply chain for uh, far more directly and it's saving people. People can then become much more cost effective. So I guess our job as a private sector and I guess our government as well is to create the infrastructure needed for people to be able to live off and be productive in that new world. And, and by the way, that also means a lot of bricks and mortar and not just right. uh, what's needed by the uh, I guess the cyber world or, or the infrastructure space on, on the telecom side. So if we can create that, then you're really becoming and, and educating people on how to use it. You're really creating a, a far more dynamic uh, environment for people to learn, access information, share it, uh, get new ideas, share them, um, and, and, and work off that in an entrepreneurial way rather than the old way of gathering information and, and, and building businesses on it. How are you preparing for that in your businesses? Because yeah. that's a dramatic change in business models the minute yeah. you take out the, the intermediaries who you're dealing with. Well, technology has always been a base for all our businesses. I mean, you can go across the board. You take, for example, I mean, just one by one on the real estate front. We were traditionally a company that built, you know, one or two lines at the very high end of the market. Yes. We're now using construction technology to take us way down the line to building yes. houses even below a million pesos and access a whole community Ayala never handled in the past. We still use the same principles. We still build communities. We like to create environments where people will be comfortable living for the long term and not just getting a one-shot deal, but at price points radically different. Those price points could not be reached if we couldn't access construction materials and new technology to take the building costs down to a different level. You take our Bank of the Philippine Islands, yes. they're now working closely with Globe Telecom to be able to create micropayments um, and, and bring down the cost of people accessing loans to a whole different level in the past. Uh, BPI was, was a bank that maybe dealt with 2 million customers for a significant component of its life. We've now moved up to 5. Our goal is to hit 10 million customers um, and be able to access components, I guess, of, of, of our public that in the past we, we did not access. Um, on the telecom space, of course, that, that's a, that's a well-known story. We really started on the high end of the business and, and we've really moved to, to a whole prepaid system where people can access telecommunication uh, accounts at a far lower price point than ever in the past. So it's all 
part of giving access to a vast majority of our population and technology is the great enabler to yes. do that. Without technology you can't do that and you can uh, go across every industry on that front, the water distribution and, yes. and many other industries we ourselves are not in. So if you can have an eye on, on technology, see how it can dis disintermediate, I guess, traditional industry structures and use it constructively, you suddenly empower yourself in a whole new market that in the past you could not reach and that's exciting. You, you just mentioned a few other business. Let me ask you, you've, you've moved fo forward in infrastructure yes. a lot in the mm -hmm. last, in this, this year in yeah. particular, you just partnered with Aboitius now that's right. on. Um, why? Yeah, well, we've always, uh, if you look at uh, the Ayala Group's history, we've always liked to align ourselves to the national development goals of the country. If you go back, way back in time, two decades ago, there was a big export thrust. We moved into the electronics field yes. and pushed that. In, in recent years, we've uh, moved quite aggressively into the business processing, outsourcing space, both on the real estate front and directly into, in, into the business itself as a way of increasing employment and, and getting people more access to this new service economy globally. Um, uh, infrastructure is a great need of the country and we feel that we have some tremendous skills that we can contribute to it. Mm -hmm. The government as well has been very encouraging of the private sector to enter that space. They've created a PPP structure. We were actually probably one of the first to enter that space when Manila Water uh, right. and the water uh, distribution system of Manila was privatized um, uh, in the past. Uh, we threw our hat in the ring. People were skeptical at the time. I'll never forget the front page article in the Wall Street Journal saying Ayala makes the biggest mistake ever. And it's been a wonderful business for us. We've been able to contribute uh, to a significant component of the city of Manila and at the same time brought prices down and taken supply up. You professionalized. Uh, the well, there were, there were challenges, but it's been an exciting area to yeah. enter. And that's given us a sense that, you know, we can make a difference in the infrastructure space. But when you move into the infrastructure space, you have a lot more dealings with government, with bidding, with um, well, all of these things. That's leave you part more and parcel, I guess, uh, of it. But I like to think that uh, our credibility um, and, and our way of doing things has also given a chance for the government uh, to access private sector groups um, that are serious about about the build out. And I think that combination, the government I think also needs private sector capital to enter this space. There's a limit to what a government budget can cover given the tremendous needs of the country. So they're creating a framework that will allow us to enter. Uh, we've done it in the past successfully. Even the liberalization of the telecom sector in a way mm -hmm. was a form of encouraging, okay. I guess, private sector capital to come in. All of these have been very successful in taking up the level of investment in the country to a whole new level. But the projects are so large that there's a limit to what our balance sheet can do. So tying up, say, with the aboitises in, in a potential bid for Mactan, uh, tying up uh, with the Metro Pacific Group for the light railway system. These are our ways of combining forces with other balance sheets and, and a similar view of what we would like to achieve to help, I guess, the country and, and, and contribute to that infrastructure build That's up. interesting. You tied up with Metro Pacific Group. Yeah. You're a competitor in the telco industry. Well, no I, I think in the end, uh, we're all in the business of creating shareholder value, uh, okay. putting risk capital to work. If there is a more efficient way to do it, uh, uh, you know, it combinations I think are a very uh, efficient way of achieving this. Uh, you know, the scale of these projects are large. As Correct. long as you both see uh, the potential of that project in the same way and what you want to achieve, the standards you want to achieve, you see them in the same way. Um, it's, I think, a very exciting thing to be able to combine forces. The capitalist system, by its very nature, encourages competition. Competition will always be there. I don't think it should be seen as a negative thing. It makes us all better. Correct. You, even in your space, I'm sure, find yeah, it. Absolutely. Uh, but that doesn't mean to say that you can't take a step back and, and, and combine forces. Find when, common when, good. Yeah, yeah. When, it, when it makes sense to do so. Um, in terms of PPP, the government had yeah. set a target of eight done by the end of the year. Yes. So far, they only have one. Are there yeah. things the government can be doing better for business? Well, I think that let me look at the positive there is a tremendous you're so half full <laughs> all the time okay there's, there's, there's tremendous appetite for yes. for private capital to invest in this space let's start with that this didn't always ha exist in the philippines there once upon a time you could only access yes. foreign exchange to be able to fund large-scale projects in the philippines now there's tremendous balance sheet capability in local companies. Uh, the banks are in very safe condition. They've built up large trust funds with funds that, are, that can be used to invest. There is, there is tremendous ability right now to get pesos invested in the system. Um, I think the government is seeing that and they're trying to move quickly to create a framework that is both fair
fair to the government and interesting to the private sector to invest in that space. Now this is relatively new, so you've got to be sympathetic to a government that wants to create the right framework for this to succeed. Because if, if it's not structured right and the balance moves you know, too much in favor of one or the other, then the equation doesn't work. So I can understand their, their concern for wanting to do things right. And yeah. this is, I think, a very serious group of people putting their heads so around you, this you're issue. You're actually cutting them a lot of slack right now, <laughs> basically. Well, put it this way. I think uh, the interest is there. People want to go in. Yeah. There has been one bid. We, we want it and we've showed yes. our excitement. Uh, we hope, of course, that uh, more and more projects will, will, will come sooner rather than later. The private sector is interested in participating and if, if I were them, I'd take advantage of yeah. that demand, which is not going to be there always forever, yes. and, um, and uh, basically encourage, I guess, mm -hmm. private sector to, to invest in that space. So um, I think they're moving along and I think it's going to be happening sooner rather than later. Yeah. It's interesting, uh, you know, at the Integrity Summit again, uh, yeah. uh, Secretary Singson was there and he talked about these processes. Yes. Uh, for DPWH, yes. um, and they held it, right? Mm -hmm. But again, those were the years where growth rates went down because we held public yeah. spending. Yeah. Um, did the gov did we find the right balance? Because we I had to so. clean up the process. Uh, well, to give Secretary Singh on uh, you know a, a pat on the back. I mean, uh, if you go back a year, the government yeah. was holding back on its spending. His department has actually been spending a tremendous this amount this year. Yes, if you look at the economic to. equation, we've had great growth for the first half of the year. I have no doubt that yes. the growth will continue in the second half. A lot of it has been the government's capacity to pump prime the economy. And, and the Secretary Singson is one major component of that. Right. He's been very active. His plans are very transparent. They're very clear for yes. anyone to see. And he's very... Uh, uh, transparent in the way he shows his projects taking place. I think it's wonderful because the government right now has a very strong economic equation. It has the capacity to do a lot more. They're being very smart in using that capacity to, to prime the economy and not just relying on the domestic demand that, that, that currently exists, which of course is a positive thing. But the Let me bring you back to telco in yeah. terms of the growth of telco for a long time were landlines and landline yes. growth now is basically dead static, and dying, yeah, right? Yeah. Staying static. Um, social media, on the other hand, mm -hmm. allows you to communicate through the same infrastructure you guys are building, right. um, but it's no it's got no income for yes. telcos. Mm -hmm. um, if social media is taking over the space of landlines mm -hmm. which used to give you income, mm -hmm. how will telcos change and survive? In well, the I future? think industries continue to shift and change and you've, you can't rely on one model forever. And I think um, uh, whatever industry you're in, and, and that's a capacity I like to think the Ayala group has been good at, is reinventing yourself based on the changing needs. Um, the telecommunication infrastructure is providing a backbone, whether it's using the Wi-Fi system or broadband uh, or the cellular network, it, it's, it's providing a service, it's being used in different ways. Nothing in the end is free. People have to pay for Wi-Fi, people right. have to pay for broadband. There is a cost. Yes. So although it looks like it's free, uh, yes. in the end, for that infrastructure to be built out, people will have to pay for access to that broadband network. And that's how the telcos will get their return on the right. risk capital and infrastructure they put out. However, that having been said, I think for the customer, it'll be at lower and lower price points Correct. over time. In fact, it seems like the telcos ma both made a mistake because the mm. pricing was very low going yes. into, into this. I mean, how does it change? No, I don't future? think so because with, with, with different pricing structures, you're really encouraging people to start to using in. it. And so it's a volume game as well. And oh, one has to be ready to participate in that. You've got to make it accessible for the customer. Correct. The customer is demanding certain price points. And um, I think telcos can build infrastructure cheaper and cheaper price points now. The network we're building out, for example, uh, this year is maybe 30% below the cost of what that similar network just three, four years ago would cost us to build. So we're able to bring the cost of our network Great. down. We put a lot of uh, pressure, I guess, on our suppliers to do that. At the same time, we want to be able to go out to the customer and bring their price point down. So um, in the end, everyone has to pay for something. It's just going to be at a lower level than I think we've been used to in the past. I have so many questions coming in now, <laughs> so I'm going to have to take some. Sure. And I'm going to throw two that are beautiful. This is one from At Night Kira. Will Jazza ever be interested in buying a TV network for at Enjoy Globe's content? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think Nike the whole is an entrepreneur, by the way. Yeah. She's I think the whole issue of content is coming in different <coughs> ways. I, uh, 
you know, certainly uh, media stations, TV stations are, are one component of that. I think content is coming from many other sources, and I think you, Maria, know that uh, as much as anybody else. I think it's going to be important for telecommunications companies to be able to access content in one way or another. Uh, we have plans, we have ways of doing it. It doesn't traditionally necessitate us going into traditional media spaces, but, but certainly there's a lot of activity already taking place can in our company. Can I just add, right. part of the reason also they don't is because margin rates for telcos are so much higher than margin <laughs> rates for <laughs> media companies. Um, sorry. Um, this is another great question from yeah. Atbia Dernasa. Mr. Zobel, what do you think is your greatest participation in the current affairs of the country? I think, um, <laughs> well, I think as a group we're quite engaged on aligning ourselves to the national economic agenda. Uh, right now there's a great need for infrastructure to be built out. I think we're a massive participant in that space. And, um, and we're creating in many ways the kind of infrastructure the country needs, both on the real estate front, the telecommunications front, the water distribution side, the, the financial network, that will help people access products and services at lower price points. And I think that kind of engagement on our part um, is, is, a, is, is a big contributor in many ways to, I guess, the needs of the country at this point in time. It's something we're very proud of in the But Alabama. you yourself are, are, you're very modest. Um, it also, you yourself, what role do you see what yourself playing in terms of well, where the country is? I, I think from, from that point of view, my, my job, I guess, is to create a, a uh, a progressive company, one that's aligned to the future, one that is aligned to, to a very open market environment that encourages risk capital to be put to play in, in new and exciting fields. And from a business point of view, um, that's that's one role I play. The other role I enjoy is, is really uh, trying to, I guess, pinpoint, you know, how the Philippines has changed as a, as a country, how important we are becoming in the global arena. I've argued for many years ago, Maria, and before it became fashionable to do so, that the service economy and our workers in the Philippines going abroad were part of globalization. Many people, maybe say five, eight, ten years ago, were embarrassed by the outflow. I argued against it from that first day. I said, the world is changing. Why is it that finance can go global, manufacturing can go global, people can put up plants in China, they can put them in Indonesia, and then sell goods in the US, but when it comes to people, that's not seen as a, as a competitive strategy. I disagreed. I said, we can become members of the service sector in the front line of many other economies, and that's part of globalization like anything else. And we have natural skills in that front. Look at what's happened. 2008 happened, and the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, said remittances to the Philippines would decline by 30 or 40 percent. It was but in all the no, reports. Yeah. It never it slowed down. Yeah, in that fact, means it's still increasing. No, that's exactly right. Which <laughs> means we are playing an important role in that global economy, Correct. irrespective of the changes taking place. Filipinos are being looked at with respect, and we're fulfilling important jobs on the front line of the healthcare industry, of the IT industry, of the construction industry, of services industries like, like the shipping industry that are important. If not, our people would not be given those jobs. I find that a strength. I yes. don't find that a weakness. Yes. Um, and uh, we're engaged in the global economy through our people. The reverse of that, uh, which is still the same phenomenon, is the whole business processing outsourcing. So they are part of the same equation. Yes. I think for us to have a natural strength in that space is a very exciting one yeah. and uh, one I think that gives us a lot of strength as a country. You're the seventh generation yeah. Ayala um, and you're, you're heading the company during a very, very dynamic mm -hmm. time. Um, how, how do you see your, this period that you're heading this group? How will it change what has been handed to you? Well, it's, it's a very exciting time. As you know, I work very closely with my brother Fernando. We work as a team in yes. Ayala and uh, you know, we cover a lot of ground so we divide up uh, the field between us. But I guess our job is to put more capital to play now than ever before. When you see, I guess, a longer term horizon uh, for an investment, you, you basically uh, uh, put more capital to play to be able to take advantage of those opportunities and participate in that growing economy. I think as a group, we have about 90 billion pesos we've committed to as a group in terms of capital expenditures in this coming year. Um, that's a big commitment. That's bigger than we've ever committed uh, to the country. But uh, our balance sheets allow us to do it. The, the, the government's management of the economy uh, gives us uh, the kind of interest rates and the kind of environment that allows our companies to do it. It's all a virtuous cycle. And so if we can keep this momentum up, if we can keep these governance standards up, if we can keep the private sector continuing to invest the way it does, we're beginning to create a virtuous cycle in the country that I think should take up uh, 
I guess, our, our, our faith in the future to a far higher level than ever in the past. And we have a, an exciting community. Uh, people are entrepreneurial in our country. They're excited about what's happening. For the first time in Ayala, we're getting people coming from abroad looking for looking jobs at. back in the Philippines correct, correct. At, a, at a stage in their lives when they have tremendous experience and skills yes. across the spectrum of industries. Um, and we're bringing them in. It's an exciting time in, in many ways. We're even getting foreigners knocking on our doors and wanting to work with the company, which is something unheard of in the past. So it's kind of a fun time. I really hope you're right. Um, <laughs> last question from social media, and then we sure. have to wrap up, guys. I've kept you longer than I should have. Uh, from at Basil Yun, Jazza, what's your succession plans for ALI and Ace Ayala yeah. Corporation? Well, uh, you know, we're a, uh, quite an organized group in that sense. You know, we're a company that yeah. professionalized a long time ago. We were probably one of the first family holding companies to list back in the 1970s. Um, Fernando and I do provide leadership as family members, but really Ayala, the Ayala group is run by first class professionals, many who could easily be ministers in the country in any position. Um, and um, we have very strong governance in each of the independent boards across the Ayala group. We have partnerships. We have very structured organizations, very strong CEOs. Um, succession is not really a, a massive worry, although it is something we pay a great deal of attention to. And if you look at the trending in our companies, people, uh, CEOs tend to shift and change quite regularly and in, in, I like to think, fairly successful ways. We bring in young people all the time and those transitions happen smoothly. We've never had any major bumps in the road. So succession is something we pay a lot of attention to and there will always be three or four people who can take a specific job at any point in time. So it's something we pay attention to. It's something we don't worry too much about only because we have processes in place in that place. will take care of it. Whether Fernando and I are there, uh, I don't think it will make a massive difference to the Ayala of tomorrow. So we don't expect to see another Ayala come in after? Well, well you never know. There is another generation of family yes, members is. coming up. Yes. Uh, they're studying hard right now. They're starting work in different parts of the world. Your daughter uh, graduated uh, from Harvard in 2010. Yes, yes, she did. She's working now in New York. And yes. I have a son who's also at college. But there are other members as well. Yes. A, and they're all working, earning their spurs independently. And so we'll see if... Uh, it all starts to happen someday. Great pressure on the next generation <laughs> of Ayalas. Um, my last question to sure. you is: uh, You're very optimistic, and I, I hope that yeah. I hope everything plans out, <laughs> that lays out the way yeah. it is. But uh, in terms of your priorities now, what do you need to see happen? Well, we're we're basically uh, um, uh, trying to get an organization, a set of organizations in our group that is as competitive as possible to be able to withstand you know, any shocks that come to the system in the future. Obviously, it's good to be optimistic, but one always prepares also for shocks. There are external shocks. We have some tensions, I guess, in, in our part of the world, in, in, in the West Philippine Sea. Uh, the European situation and the Euro US situation crisis, has yeah, not yet. Yeah. You know, and we're so interconnected financially. While I believe as a country, we're far more resilient to these shocks. Our banking system's in great shape. Yeah. Our, our monetary authorities have handled the economy of the country very well. Interest rates are low, but surprises do happen. Yeah. Um, and so our job, I guess, to always make sure our balance sheets remain strong, uh, not to overstretch ourselves, build a great group of people who are imaginative and adjust to changing times, don't take standard uh, industry structures as a given and are willing to change uh, with the time. If we can create the kind of workforce and leadership in particular in the Ayala Group that is attuned to change and is comfortable with change, then you can really adjust to most problems in the world. And we've been through crisis in the past uh, as a company. We've survived them. The company's still here and growing and contributing. I like to think we can build that kind of organization, irrespective of what happens in the future. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jaime. Thanks very much. <coughs> we've, been speaking, we've been speaking with Jaime Augusto Zabel de Ayala, the chairman of the Ayala Group of Companies. Uh, send your questions. You can continue sending your questions, and we'll make sure he gets them. Uh, <laughs> and Jaime, by the way, is one of the few CEOs very active on social media. He's got a Facebook account. You can look for his public Facebook page. And also, if you send them on Twitter and Facebook to Rappler.com, we'll try to get you answers. This is Talk Thursday. I'm Maria Ressa. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Maria, too. Thank Thanks you. for having, for, for doing <laughs> this. You know, optimistic. <laughs> no dark clouds. No. Well, you have to be, I guess, to, to well, continue doing yeah, what you're we're doing. We're offline, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but we'll <laughs> audio off, guys.